Hey there, it is Saturday, so it's movie night, and I'm here to present another quarantine quadruple feature for your viewing pleasure. My name is Paul. Uh, we just finished our 24th week of quarantine. 24 weeks. Now, what's crazy is that experts say that if we had like a total lockdown for like, let's say six weeks, that this whole coronavirus thing would be done. So six weeks is like all the cycle it would take. Today marks four times that. We could have gotten over this four times already, like several other countries have already done, but you know, America has just proven that we are the most selfish country in the world, not willing to make sacrifices for for anyone's safety. So it's it's pretty sad. But here we are, we're still in we're still in quarantine and this week has proven to continue to be just as terrible as all the others. Jacob Blake, an unarmed black man, was shot seven times in the back by police as he was walking away from them to get back in his SUV with three children. His three children in the car saw him get gunned down seven times. That's of course awful. And then some shitty, you know, white nationalist kid, some 17 year old kid driven 60 miles across state lines by his white trash mother to a protest with an automatic rifle. While he's there, cops give him bottles of water, encourage him, say, you're doing a good thing. Then he kills two people. And of course, yesterday we got the news um, that we lost Chadwick Boseman, really wonderful actor. His most recent film was Spike Lee's The Five Bloods, which is now gonna be a more resonant performance because he plays uh, someone who died young in Vietnam and all of his squad has gone gone on to live their lives and grow older. Of course, the loss of Chadwick Boseman is an incalculable loss. And I mean, in a particularly shitty 2020 ironic twist, it's like out of all of the, what seems like hundreds of white movie stars that are playing all of these superhero roles in that entire expanded universe, the one black actor who's actually helmed one of these films, who has arguably meant more to a group of people than any of these other superheroes, who has paved the way for representation in cinema, particularly with these kind of big budget superhero type movies, of course, that's the one who is, who is lost. I mean, I feel like it was just kind of like, the actor that would be the, the the biggest blow to the biggest group of people. He kind of became the go-to guy for if there's like a black hero, a black sports figure, musician, someone that needs to be portrayed just right, whether it's James Brown, Jackie Robinson, T'Challa, you knew the role was gonna be safe in his capable hands. You knew he was gonna be able to play that role and do it justice. And to find out that he was doing a lot of this charity work and working with cancer organizations and of course acting in these movies that gave a lot of people a lot of happiness and a lot of hope. To find out he was doing all of that while he was in pain and suffering from cancer is kind of like, you know, sometimes the actors kind of play the hero and it's like a movie star, but sometimes it kind of transcends that. And you know there's something a little more special with them and that they are kind of more actual hero stats. So so that one's, that one's, that one's shitty, especially so young. Um, so today we've got four movies we're gonna explore. And I've often gone back and forth with like, should I just jump straight into the movies or should I just give a quick recap of what's happened in that week and, and you know everyone who's watching these already knows all of the stuff that i'm talking about but i was thinking in the future even if these don't find like a wide audience that maybe these videos would be kind of a time capsule for the insanity that we were going through in 2020 um or maybe like my kids in the future well what was that like oh i have these things i, I don't know i don't know so yeah i'm just kind of recapping a little bit for some of the things that happened um now even though i've been in quarantine for like over 160 days or something like that. For the first time, Gina and I were gonna venture out of the house. We needed a vacation. She's been working so hard, I'm very proud of her. But we had a trip to the Sequoias planned. We had it planned for about a month, that way we could be like isolated. We had kind of a cabin up there. And then of course, all of California started burning down and it was affecting the air quality up in the Sequoias about a week before we left. But we decided not to cancel the trip and we still went and you know the air wasn't um super crisp and clean but it was it but it was fine and there was actually less people there because of it that national park when we were walking around there but there were not very many people there and it was really beautiful and, and nice the day we left on our trip it was basically the first time i ventured out into the world i have not had a one-on-one -on -one communication with a human that's not gina in 
uh, like half a year, maybe something with a cashier, but it's usually just in and out as quick as I can whenever I have to run an errand. We stopped at the gas station right away, so we were out of the house like five minutes, and I'm gonna check all of the tire pressure in, in Gina's tires. So we back up to the air machine. So the car's parked here. So here's the driver's seat right up front, and I'm down here by the first wheel well, and I'm checking the air pressure. And my back is kind of turned like this, so I can see Gina in the driver's seat. She's holding Pepper, and I'm, I'm not bending down all the way so you can't see me, but I'm all the way down. And then I hear like, um, Paul, watch out! Paul, what? Fuck, stop the car! Stop! What are you doing? Stop! And I turn around, and there's a car backing into me, like full speed backing, and he slams on his brakes, and this guy, he's a couple feet away from Gina's car, but he was about to like roll right over me. So he hits the brakes. I'm still bent all the way down at this point. And then I just hear the guy, he unrolls his back window and starts screaming at Gina, right? And the first thing he does is just start like, you know you're dealing with someone who's like really smart. Uh, he starts like imitating her voice. Stop, stop the car, stop, it's driving too fast. And, and it was like, are you kidding me? So he keeps backing up. I get out of the way, I see him now. And then he kind of like pulls up and he's still like screaming at her. And I don't think he realizes that he almost squished someone and that she's not alone. So he's like kind of pulling up and, and he has both windows unrolled. And I stand up and he sees me. And, and he's like, he's like, oh, uh, hey, I was just trying to park here. And I was like, this isn't a parking space. What's your problem? Why are you yelling at her? And he's like, I was just trying to back up and she started screaming at me. And then she's still going, Gina's still going. And she's like, oh, fuck you, get out of here, fuck you. And then the guy's like, <laughs> he like puts his car into drive and he's like, fucking Karen, and like peels out and drives away. So I don't even know why he was trying to park. It was the first time Gina's been called a Karen. I asked her if she's been called a Karen and she said no. That was how our trip started. That was my first five minutes out of the house in like 160 days. And then I was like, oh, the world really has gone crazy. I'm not gonna be able to interact with anyone. But it was actually a pretty nice trip. So that was kind of my recap of the week. Um, and now uh, we're gonna talk about uh, four films that I'm going to recommend. Now, the thing that I miss most about the old world is going to the movies. I would go to the movies multiple times a week. I love going to the movies. It's my absolute favorite thing. It's a really important part of Gina and I's relationship, and obviously we haven't been able to go see movies. We've gone to the drive-ins a few times. It's just not quite the same. There's a big performative aspect to going to the drive-ins now with some of these kind of specialty screenings I've been to where they're screening like older movies. There's a lot of horn honking and lights flashing during like the iconic moments and lines and it can get pretty annoying. <laughs> it's more about like, look how well I know this movie, not look, I'm just watching this movie and shutting the fuck up and enjoying it. This is not quite the same, and I've really, I really miss going to the movies, like a whole lot. And this is easily the longest I've gone without going to the movies in my entire life. I mean, my parents used to take me to the movies when I was a baby. My first memory is sitting in a movie theater for the never ending story, uh, looking at the rock monster, trying to comprehend what I was looking at. So this is the longest I've ever gone without going to the movies. And in fact, within the next two weeks on September 10th, that will be six months since I've seen a movie in a movie theater. And that probably doesn't sound like a very big deal to most of you, but, but it's, it is a massive change of way of life for me. Today, we are gonna examine four films that are about the magic of going to the movies. So four films where characters are going to the movies, taking place in a movie theater, experiencing the magic of watching movies on the big screen. That's today's theme, the magic of going to the movies. So I'm very sentimental about the movies and the movies we're gonna watch today, some of them, they veer on the saccharine. They're, they're pretty cheesy and we're just gonna lean into the schmaltz on some of these movies because people who really unabashedly love cinema, when they make movies about it, it can get a little, it can get a little sappy and nostalgic and and corny, but you know we're just leaning right into it with the with the four that we're watching today. Now there are a couple other movies that I really like about going to the movies that I'll just talk about very briefly. This is a four pack, so I'll just kind of cover it. The Majestic, definitely corny movie. Um, Frank Darabont's 
least effective film, but still pretty good. A nice tender performance from Jim Carrey. They're restoring an old movie theater. And if you need a dose of nostalgia for going to the movies, The Majestic is sure to give you some of that. Last Action Hero is about a kid who's going to see the newest action movie from his favorite action star played by Arnold Schwarzenegger. And then the kid like gets sucked into the movie while he's there and then you know has to navigate the the the, the movie knowing all of the cliches that are going to happen essentially the same premise for woody allen's the purple rose of cairo you know it's about a, a woman trying to escape an abusive relationship and she spends her time going to the movies that's her escapism and there's this like um this dream boat that she loves in these movies and he comes out of the movie screen and she kind of pursues a relationship with this with this guy and then of course there is demons this is an italian horror film this movie is absolutely wild this isn't really nostalgic or loving about movies it's just the entire thing is set in a movie theater as a bunch of people are invited to an advanced screening uh, of this of this new movie about these people who put on this mask and then it cuts them and then they start turning into demons and affecting one another. That's the premise of the movie they're watching and the mask is actually on display in the theater lobby and someone puts it on and they cut themselves and they turn into a demon and then they start turning everyone in the movie theater about a demon. So it's like kind of a survivalist horror film that takes place in a movie theater and it's it's wild. Some of the choices this movie makes don't make any sense and they're totally bad shit, but it's, it's a lot of fun. Classic Italian horror from the 80s. Demons, okay. Um, now the actual four that we are going to be watching. The first is the only children's movie that Martin Scorsese has made, Hugo, for which he won the Golden Globe for Best Director. This came out in 2011. Hugo is a kid who's an orphan. He lives in a train station, which is already super cool for any kids watching this movie. That'd be such a cool setting uh, to be able to live if you're, if you're a young person. And he has a little room where his dad has left him like a robot and a notebook. And he tries to solve this great big mystery involving the notebook, the robot, a mysterious person, and uh, movies in general. This movie is, is very much a love letter to, to classic cinema. And it, it is overly sentimental, but it is clearly made by a true movie lover. Like a movie like this could only be made by someone who's most important, the most important thing in their lives is movies. It's really just a testament to to how important movies are. <clears throat> Next movie, Joe Dante's Matinee from 1995, I believe. <clears throat> Matinee has John Goodman playing a William Castle type character. William Castle was a filmmaker and producer who used all of these cheesy gimmicks to get people into the seats, whether it was like people in a costume running through the theater or something coming from the ceiling or your seats buzzing, like in the tingler. And the only way, if you feel your seat vibrating, that means the tingler's coming to get you. The only way to stave the tingler off is by screaming. He had all of these really cheesy gimmicks to pack the theaters, but um, reading about them and learning about the crazy shit he did is actually really fun. It would be really fun to go to those movies. In fact, I actually went to a movie marathon once where they screened The Tingler, and during The Tingler scenes, there's a scene that takes place in a movie theater. They shut all the lights off in the movie theater. Well, it, uh, the, so the screen goes black is what I mean. And they actually had someone running around the movie theater throwing this weird like slug puppet into people's laps. And he actually threw it into my lap and it actually scared the shit out of me. So he plays a William Castle type character. It takes place during the Cuban Missile Crisis. So it's in 1962 and it really is capitalizing on the fear of atomic bombs, and which was uh, actually very popular thing in the 50s and 60s for horror films. There was uh, kind of a lot of atomic horror. So an atomic bomb goes off and then a tarantula gets huge or ants get huge or something like that. We're actually going to talk a lot about these movies on another week, but this movie is kind of a reflection of that time and the movie they're all going to see at the movie theater is called Mant and it's it's very funny in fact the full Mant feature is uh, included as a, as a special feature. It's only a few minutes long, but Joe Dante's matinee really celebrates kind of the absurdity of some extremes theater promoters will do, but it's it's a lot of fun and just watching everyone kind of in the movie theater have a good time is what makes this one so, so enjoyable. Similar movie from the same decade, 1991 horror film, Popcorn. Now Popcorn takes place during a horror movie marathon. And I actually saw Popcorn in a movie theater during a horror movie marathon for the first time, the first time I saw it. It was actually the same marathon that I saw The Tingler in as well. So Popcorn is 
about a, a movie theater that is having a horror movie marathon and they have similar gimmicks going on as they do in matinee. So there's, you know, a movie about a killer mosquito and they have like this giant mosquito fly from the ceiling. So they have kind of gimmicks like that, like smell-o-vision type shit. But there is also an, an actual killer going around the movie theater murdering people. So the whole thing is set in and around a movie theater. So it's a lot of fun kind of watching the fun and chaos of like a rambunctious all-night movie marathon, which I love going to. It's very much like Phantom of the Opera, but in a movie theater set during a horror movie marathon. So that's Popcorn by Mark Harrier. Our last movie that we are going to watch. I saved this one for last instead of first, even though I think this is probably the best movie ever made about loving movies and going to the movies. This movie touches my soul on such a profound level. It was made in 1988. It's absolutely beautiful. And I think it is only right to save this movie for last because We've now been doing these quarantine quadruple features for 24 weeks. We had an extra one in one of those weeks as well for 4th of July. So this is officially the 100th film that we will be watching for our quarantine quadruple features. So this is my official 100th recommendation to you. That's how long we've been in quarantine. And this one is really just about the magic and love of movies, Cinema Paradiso. This is an Italian film. I absolutely love it. It is beautiful, it is tender, it is sentimental, but it is really one of the loveliest films that I've ever seen. Uh, I, I had a friend over once and um, you know, she saw my box set and she's like, oh, I love that movie. I was like, oh yeah, I love, I love Cinema Paradiso. And she was like, <laughs> you call it Cinema Paradiso? Paul, it's Cinema Paradiso. And it was like, Get the fuck out of my house, are you kidding me? But anyway, Cinema Paradiso. It is about a filmmaker who's looking back on his childhood in his small Italian village and how he came to fall in love with movies and the relationship that he had with the town's movie projectors, kind of this old guy who projects the movies. Um, there's also some love and some actual drama in the movie, some, some heartbreak, some tears, a lot of laughs, but mainly it's just a really beautiful look at the type of people that dedicate their lives to the silver screen. It is one of the most beautiful movies made about loving movies, and I absolutely wholeheartedly recommend Cinema Parody. So there's two cuts. There's a theatrical cut that actually won the Academy Award for Best Foreign Film, and then there's a director's cut as well. And it's not just like we've restored a couple minutes. It's like like a big chunk is added to the movie. I think the theatrical cut is a little like brisker and more emotional. You can't go wrong with either cut though. It's a really beautiful movie. Those are the four movies we're gonna watch to remember our love for going to the movies, the magic of the cinema. So we're gonna watch Martin Scorsese's Hugo, Joe Dante's Matinee, Mark Harrier's Popcorn, and Giuseppe Tornatore's masterpiece, Cinema Paradiso. Folks, I hope you are taking care of yourselves, staying healthy, staying sane, watching great movies. Thanks for watching our first 100 recommendations for Quarantine Quadruple Features. See you next week.